start our service today, I want to talk a minute about these couple slips that are in your bulletin and why they're there. Next week starts Advent. How did that happen? Um, and our theme this year is a program called Generation to Generation. So as part of our weekly Advent candle wreath lighting, we will be having families with multiple generations help us light uh, the candles each week. And in that program, it answers, it asks four questions and we're hoping to answer four questions with everyone's help. So since Advent starts next week, we need to gather next week's questions starting, the answers starting today. So for the next four weeks, there will be these purple slips with a very simple question to which we want your very simple answers. Literally two words, three words, four words. Put these in the offering plate, and then next week, our readers will anonymously read our responses. So for example, today is what gives you hope? It could be, I don't know, Thanksgiving, a new baby, um, a puppy, whatever it might be. So put, use it, you know, we have pen, pencil, just a few words, put it in the plate. Next week's question I think is what gives you fear? Um, and et cetera. So that's our program this year. Uh, any questions, ask me. Uh, Mary, Carol, the people on spiritual care can help you out. So, that being said, let's take a moment and gather our hearts and minds for worship. Please join me in today's call of worship when we vote to. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. The earth should change, the mountains should shake. nations are in an uproar, the kingdoms honor. Then God utters his voice and the earth melts. God makes war cease to the end of the earth. God breaks our weapons of destruction, shatters the bow and spear, burns the shields with fire. God's reign is on its way. After Jesus was baptized and was praying, Heaven was opened, and his spirit descended upon him like a dove. A voice came from heaven, saying, You are my son, the beloved, and you I am well pleased. Come, let us prepare the faith of God. Our first hymn of praise is number five, Let All Things Now Living, verses one and two, after the season's introduction.
join me in this morning's prayer of confession. Let us search our memories and ask Christ the King, Lord, when, we, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? Advent season. 
Today is the last Sunday of the church year. Christ the King is a feast day, and so our garments for our, our, um, our sanctuary are white. Because today we think about, we reflect on the holiness of Jesus from his beginning to the end of his life. This is a challenging reading, and Karen even said to me, can you give me some reason why we're reading this reading, which sounds like it's for Good Friday today on Christ the King Sunday? And the answer is, I'm challenging us to follow the lectionary this fall, and this is the lectionary reading. This reading poses this question, a very big question, what does it all mean? What does this, the, the full arc of this story mean? It all starts with uncanny optimism, right? We're going to move into that season of optimism and new hope in Advent. And the lectionary actually has two readings for today. This, the first one is also from the Gospel. It's the reading about John the Baptist's father. After he opened his mouth for the first time, an angel had struck him speechless in the temple. Because Zechariah had scoffed at God. Instead of believing that God was about to give Zechariah and his wife a son in their old age, Zechariah might have been afraid of believing what he really, really wanted was about to come true. Maybe he was afraid to admit that he still held on to this hope. Maybe he was afraid of looking like a fool. The son of their dreams is coming into their lives. And dare to dream is a big part of today's message. Zechariah is humbled and amazed when God fulfills his dearest dream. Picture him with his infant son in his arms as he reads this part of his reading to the people. It had seemed too good to be true, but Zechariah proclaims God's promises throughout history are about to be fulfilled because now he's seen it in his life. His life is a microcosm of the big story. And so Zechariah pronounces, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel who has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. God has raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of his servant David. God has remembered his holy covenant, his promise, the oath that God swore to our ancestor Abraham to grant that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve God without fear in holiness and righteousness. And then Zechariah, speaking of his son and to his son, he says, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. You will give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins. And we know Zechariah's sons will prepare God's people for the coming of Jesus. He will forgive their sins in, in baptism. And he will baptize Jesus, his cousin, and usher in the Holy Spirit who empowers Jesus in ministry. And we also know that Zechariah's son will be murdered by Herod. Nevertheless, Zechariah proclaims, by the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. So why did Zechariah's son have to die? And when we read today's gospel text, I think we're supposed to ask the same question. Why did Jesus have to die? Both men were young men. They had just begun their adult lives. And each of them had faded trouble, serious trouble before. And Luke 4, the congregation of Jesus' family synagogue, became so enraged with Jesus that they tried to walk him off a cliff. And Jesus could have died right then. But Jesus didn't let them do that. He just walked straight through the crowd, through the angry mob. We know Jesus can get out of 
trouble when he needs to. And yet by the end of their short lives, both these young men appear to walk into death almost willingly. So why are they doing this? This week, on Monday, I heard the story of a Russian dissident, a man who refuses to talk, stop telling the truth. Even though twice <coughs> he was nearly poisoned to death. His name is Vladimir Kara Mirza. I don't know if you've heard about him. I heard about him on NPR on Monday. So Vladimir's wife and his young sons live in the United States. He left the United States, though, recently and returned to Russia. He returned to Russia even while Russian men who didn't want to fight in Ukraine are leaving Russia. Why don't they return to Russia to be part of the demonstrations against the war? And his wife spoke for him. She said he had to be there with those people who went out on the streets and were arrested, referring to the many Russians who had been detained for opposing the war. He wanted to show that you shouldn't be afraid in the face of that evil. And she said, I deeply respect and admire him for that. And then she added, and I could kill him. In Russia, Vladimir was detained for disobeying a police officer during these demonstrations. And once in custody, he was accused of spreading false information about Russia's military and higher leadership. Last month, Vladimir was charged with state treason. The evidence against him is based on a speech he gave in Arizona, where he said Russia was committing war crimes in Ukraine with cluster bombs in residential areas and the bombing of maternity hospitals and schools. Now these are all facts that have been independently documented, but Russian investigators said that these were statements and they are false because the defense ministry does not permit the use of banned means of conducting war, so there are no cluster bombs, and insists that Ukraine's civilian population is not a target. So Vladimir's crime is to speak out against the word that had come from the Kremlin. For the Russian state, the suffering of people was immaterial. All that matters is what they're trying to get people to believe from their point of view. And from his prison cell, Vladimir is writing long letters to the press and to his supporters. He says that the Kremlin wants to portray Putin's opponents as traitors, but the real traitors, he says, are those who are destroying the well-being, the reputation, and the future of our country for the sake of their personal power, not those who are speaking out against them. His long handwritten letters from prison, they're trying to convince the world that Russia is not doomed to autocracy and that Russian people are not all brainwashed by the Kremlin. He says that the large number of letters he gets from supporters who openly criticize Ukraine and the invasion, the Ukrainian invasion and the Kremlin gives him hope. He urges the West not to isolate that part of Russian society that wants a different future for our country. That's what he says. Vladimir is using his own body. He has been poisoned twice and survived. He's using his own body to open up a free space to show the world that all the people of Russia are not following the Kremlin. Now, I'm not saying that Vladimir is a Jesus figure, and I don't know if he's a Christian or an atheist or even a good man, but the story of a patriot who loves his country so much that he would return when he doesn't have to, when it's deadly for him to return, that he would refuse to be silent about the truth that his government has made it a crime to say aloud. That, I am saying, is an awful lot like what John the Baptist and Jesus were doing in their time. It's like John the Baptist, who had a friendly relationship with Herod, but still, to his face and in public, said it was immoral to divorce his first wife and take his brother's wife, Herod's brother's wife, as his own. That 
brought him into prison. He didn't have to say that. And it's also like Jesus, who could have taken his own advice, the advice that he gives his disciples, when he said, just when people refuse you, you can sweep the dust off your feet when they were rejected. So there are other responses. We don't all have to run into danger. Running into danger is something that one does with tremendous discernment. And I believe that John the Baptist and Jesus used tremendous discernment. When the combined forces of Jewish leaders and Roman military came for Jesus, he did not vanish that time. He allowed himself to be captured, tried, and condemned. And on the cross that terrible day, we see that the crucifixion was not a special torment just for Jesus. It was a, a form of public terror, a tactic, save for people whom the Romans and the Jews, too, wished to make an example of, people who did not knuckle under, people who stood up for their people. Jesus, too, testified to how Jerusalem's religious leaders and the Roman occupiers failed to safeguard the lives and health and well-being of God's people. Jesus showed them to be anything but good shepherds, right? That's the vision that we get from the Gospels, his whole ministry. He shows that. He shows that they were instead wolves who cruelly fed on their flocks instead of protecting them and benefiting their people. And this was directly contrary to the word that came from the Roman Empire. Caesar was greeted by the crowds on the street. It was mandatory to get out there. He was the savior of his people. And in fact, the savior of all humanity. And at his right hand there was Pilate, and at his right hand there's Herod. In title and position, they are their people's benefactors. That is what everyone is supposed to say and think. But when you read the gospel, we don't think so. The one who stands up for God's love for God's people, the one who believes in the dignity and the worthiness of each person, even if that one is ridiculed and tormented and humiliated to the bitter end, that is the person whom God lifts up and God exalts. In the good news of Jesus Christ, God exalts the one who discerned that through this very process of martyrdom, Dying for what one believes in, choosing the moment to willingly run into the furnace of oppression and to stand up against the highest leaders and their hatred and lies. That this process of doing this is the very last chance to invert the most stubborn and cynical and invulnerable evil of this earth. By their utter innocence, John and Jesus show the full force of the evil that they were going against. And that evil comes down and slaps them down and tries to destroy them. And this, this effort of theirs creates space for others to free themselves from being entrapped in that same evil. Today's story, we see that at the very last moments of Jesus' life, became the moment of liberation for one of the men who was being crucified alongside him. The crucifixion, as Luke tells it, is full of the force of social humiliation and political and religious destruction, not just of bodies, but of people's reputations and who they are. It's a public repudiation a death meant to terrorize the city, warning everyone not to follow in the way of Jesus, lest they too will be destroyed. Among criminals, Jesus is taunted by the leaders who say, save yourself. Jesus is taunted by the Roman soldiers, save yourself, Jesus. <coughs> The inscription over his head from Pilate, King of the Jews, it's meant to utterly repudiate who Jesus was and what he stood for. 
This state and religious execution is meant to wipe Jesus out and all that he did and all that he meant to people. And yet the fellow hanging on the cross next to Jesus beholds the innocence of Jesus and feels a holy awe, fear, and reverence. There is something very wrong, and we all feel it. It's very wrong and unholy when everyone gangs up on an innocent person. Almost time to finish this. Good. <laughs> all this dying man, the good thief we call him, all he does is acknowledge the truth and cry out to Jesus. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. It's a statement of faith and wish. It's a dream. He has this dream at the end of his life. And Jesus always gives us what we ask for. He asks, what shall I do for you? And then he does it. And he does it for this man. Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus' power is in his acceptance and surrender to the evil all around him. He doesn't change it, but we are changed through him. At the completion of his ministry, Jesus discerned that it was time to submit himself to the truth. That the only way out of unrepenting evil is through the evil. To disempower evil means to persist and risk and hold on to what is holy at all costs in the face of the evil. I use the example of Vladimir in Russia because this, his brave story shows how forces that oppress and entangle us stultify us, keep us from being free. Keep us from facing the very hard changes that must be made. However, the story of Jesus is much bigger than political resistance. I believe we are all entangled and oppressed by different forces in our lives. And Jesus showed this too through the course of his ministry. Forces that say that blind and sick and disabled and old and poor people are nuisance or a curse and they shouldn't be at the very center of our hearts, our lives, our communities. Forces that say children don't matter. Forces that say when we are hurt or fearful or pain or worried that we are weak, that we are losers and therefore we are unworthy. We don't deserve to have our needs met. We don't matter. Our world and our minds are full of scoffers, belittlers, skeptics. Sometimes we're our worst enemy, right? Just as Jesus' execution was full of these terrible voices. They're voices that say, you're stuck in a job that breaks you down every day and it's your fault. Or you lost your job and you were never very good at it anyway. Or your loved one has a debilitating illness and now your life is over too. Maybe you're stuck in an unhappy or destructive relationship and too bad. You get what you deserve. Or you drink too much or eat too unhealthily and you can't help but believe, I don't deserve to be more or worse, much worse, we can pile the views on another person. We can scoff at, uh, at their dreams of a better life. Today's message from Christ the King, and I believe that's why the lectionary put this here, is a gigantic no to all those voices. The scoffers, the belittlers, the skeptics do not get the last word like Jesus and even a bit like Vladimir, we too can rush into a bad situation when we discern that that's where the Holy Spirit is sending us. And we can refuse to let that situation define us. We can hold fast as Jesus held fast to his innocence and like the good thief, we too can turn and at any moment we can believe that we can be released from our former sins. Jesus offers us release. That's what forgiveness of sins means, to be released, to be liberated out of our sins and out of our old patterns. And that's when we can turn and believe and embrace and liberation in the deep meaning of our lives and the true life that Jesus offers us amidst 
every circumstances. And this is the way, in our own way, in all the, the minor, microcosm parts of our lives where we feel hemmed in, we can usher in the reign of Jesus Christ, the King in our lives. So pray with me. Jesus, our brother, help us be brave in the face of cynicism. Help us be brave among naysayers, especially when we do that to ourselves and to our loved ones. Lord, we ask you, like Zechariah, that we may feel the light of your dawn. Guide our feet into the way of peace. Amen.
but it's not 3D, it's only 2D. It's quilted and it's on the left hand side as you go out. It is covered right now with, a, well, last time I looked, with 15 ornaments. And Stacy is our liaison to the starfish client. Stacy's here with us today. So if you have any questions as you pick an ornament and prepare to, to purchase and to prepare a beautiful gift for one of our starfish family members. If you have any questions, now's the time to ask Stacy. The um, starfish team needs our, uh, our gifts by December 1st, so it's a very quick turnaround. Um, so today we are hanging the greetings with Loft Church. We will need help from any People who are good at lifting with a uh, big tree, which is still in the barn. Um, and at 12, there will be pizza and, and snacks, and so you're welcome to join us and the Loft Church. I hope you all will, and that we can decorate together. Also tonight, I'll be going to the Interfaith uh, Thanksgiving service with uh, people from all different congregations. All of them, each congregation feeds into Hunterdon Central Regional High School. So they're the congregations that support our high school students. And Thanksgiving is a national holiday. And Thanksgiving is the common basis to each one of the religions that are in our group. So it's a beautiful day to listen and to witness to this shared heritage of giving thanks to God in this season. If you can't come, there is, um, oh, I need to send, I thought I'd have it here. There's a tiny URL uh, where you can zoom in. Uh, now I wonder if there are any um, prayer requests that haven't been given to me in advance. Karen. You do talk about the sharing of the purple entity you had wanted to share. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Prayer requests? Yeah. I'm going to ask also for prayers for my son Michael. Uh, we were in the ER yesterday and he hurt his back and he has really dangerous job. So um, I'm going to ask that we pray for him as well. Uh, first, I wanted to challenge you a little bit. So, you've already done this for yourself. One of the things that we tried at Reformation Sunday was to have more back and forth in, the, in our church worship service. But this Advent, I'd like to challenge you to go to a family member and have a conversation about hope and see if you can distill something that you can bring back from that conversation and get it to me in email. I'll put that in our weekly email. But I'm hoping you can share some of the light like we've been doing with our meditation prayer walk and just have one conversation this week about hope. So let us pray. Pastor, yes. Oh, I'm sorry, Stacy, I didn't see you. Uh, yeah, I'm a dad to wife's son, Jerry, who's in her birthday car accident last night. And they don't know what is going to happen. Your dad to wife's son, Jerry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You absolutely love the prayers. How old is he? Uh, he's 16. And she's in the car with the other. 
Almighty, gracious God, we give you thanks and praise today for gathering us together in this season of gathering and giving thanks. We are so thankful for the ministry of your Son, Jesus Christ, on this earth that encourages us and gives us hope. Lord, we ask you to share some of that hope today. First, we ask for Gary, who needs our prayers and who needs your help in his life now. Holy Spirit, we call you down upon Gary. We ask you to infiltrate his cells and his breathing and his hospital room and his ventilator. And we ask you, Lord, to give him strength and courage and to abide in, in your grace. We ask you to be with everyone who loves Gary. Lord, we ask you to give them hope and to also surround him with medical experts who can bring him to the fuller healing. We pray also for the other family who has lost a loved one in this terrible accident. Lord, we pray for all the people who rushed into this terrible accident, the people who came as lifesavers. And we ask you to restore them as well. Lord, we are praying too for me. Emily's friend who has lost his father. Surround him with your grace and love and let him feel your care as he mourns this terrible loss. And we pray too for Rob, for his advanced cancer. Lord, this is a terrible diagnosis and we are asking you to be with Rob and to let him feel your strength and to seek your healing. And we pray too for Larry's cousin, Joyce, in London. We pray, Lord, because Joyce has very difficult symptoms in her back and with indigestion, and we are not sure what is going on, and she doesn't know what's going on, but we lift her up into your hands and into your graces. Lord God, you offer us abundant blessings as we approach Thanksgiving, our national holiday of gratitude and the new liturgical year. We pause to give you thanks and praise. We acknowledge all the good gifts that come from you and for all the many ways you bless us. And as the sun sinks early these days and days grow short in this darkening season, we pray for the people who languish and who yearn for a break from bad news and from heavy burdens. We lift them up to you and we lift ourselves up to you with all of our hope-filled petitions for the needs of your people. And we humble ourselves before you, Christ our King, to pray for our redemption and for the world's redemption. Redeem us, O Lord. May we live and love and forgive as you did. May we resist evil forces that seek to turn us from a humane path. May we embrace your way of peace, transformed for lives of love and grace. Now, Lord, hear us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our final hymn of dedication is number 473. 
May your lives reflect Christ's glory and honor his name. May God, the creator, redeemer, and sustainer bless you.